So we have concluded now with Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Herodians. Now we're going to come to another group, the Zealots, and then I hope at the end I can make uh, some comparisons between Herodians, Zealots, and modern-day <coughs> counterparts. Zealots, Z-E-A-L-O-T-S. Now they're a very interesting group. I think you're going to like them here. They're very. In they're all interesting. We don't have a lot of information about the zealots in the New Testament, but they are very interesting. Well, how can we describe them? They are the radicals and the revolutionaries of their day. Let's start with that. They are the radicals and the revolutionaries of their day. One of Jesus' disciples, we have to say this because this is the only place where we're going to see the term zealot in the New Testament. One of Jesus' disciples is called, in the King James, Simon Zelotes. Simon Zelotes. Luke 6, 15, and Luke also records that in Acts 1, 13. One of the Lord's own apostles, one of the twelve, you know Simon Peter, there were two Simons who were apostles, Simon Zelotes. I doubt you had too many messages on Simon Zelotes. Probably barely named the twelve apostles, if they, even that. But you know a lot about one of those Simons, the chief apostle of the twelve, Simon Peter. But here's another Simon, Simon Zelotes. So that's Luke's work. In Matthew and Mark, when they give their list of apostles, Matthew 10 and Mark 3, they give the list of 12 of them. Peter always begins the list, and Judas always ends the list, and the others are different names and different arrangements. And in Matthew and Mark, they have an apostle called Simon the Canaanite. Well, my question to you tonight to begin with then would be, how can we explain this? Let's just look at these passages very quickly, starting with uh, Luke's, and then we'll look at Matthew's and Mark's. How can we explain this? Matthew and Mark refer to an apostle by the name Simon the Canaanite. Now, that could hardly be the si same as Simon Zelotes. The, uh, you've got the name Simon, but so what? Simon Peter. You could have several different Simons. You've got several different uh, James, by the way, James the Greater and James the Less. Well, over in Luke chapter 6, I just want you to see these so you'll see where they are and what they say. In Luke 6, 15, Luke is giving us uh, his account of the 12 apostles. He gives us Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes. Simon called Zelotes. Uh, and then you've got Judas and Judas Iscariot. You've got two men by the name of Judas right there in verse 16. Simon called Zelotes. So his name was Simon, okay? What he was called was Zelotes. Now, that's a little different than what, than what you get over in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13 where he simply calls Simon Zelotes. Uh, Acts 1, 13. When they were coming in, they went to an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes. Simon, nothing in between, Zelotes. But he doesn't mean Simon Zelotes like Cheno Ross. Simon, as we were told over in Luke's gospel, called Zelotes. Simon Zelotes is not first and last name in Acts 1.13. It's, it's over in Luke 6.15 you get the real answer. Simon, his name, and he was called Zelotes. Well, then what are we going to do I would ask you with Matthew chapter 10, uh, 2 and following. Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew. By the way, there's another reference to Matthew in his own gospel. Matthew's writing Matthew. He calls himself Matthew in 9 9, and he names himself as an apostle. Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus. Labius, whose surname was Phidias, generally pronounced Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite. 
and Judas Iscariot who also betrayed him. And then if you go over to Mark chapter, and you may want to hold your finger there in Matthew. We'll be back here in just a moment. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 18, we've got Simon, James, John, verse 18, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, or Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite. And Simon the Canaanite. How may, may we explain this? Well, very easily if we know a little bit of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. So let's do this in about three steps here. Number one, we're going to give you an easy explanation. You may want to have your pens ready for a little Bible correction also. The Greek behind Matthew and Mark is Kananios. I'll spell it in English for you. K-A-N-A-N-A-I-N. O-S. Kananios. K-A-N-A-N-A-I-O-S. That's the Greek now in Matthew and Mark. We don't need to know the Greek over in Luke as you'll, you'll see why. We don't need to know that here in a moment. We do need to know this business about the Canaanite, Simon. The, you ever read that, noticed that, wondered about it? I know I said something years ago. That was back in our first building about that man and that name, Canaanite, but I don't suppose any of you remember that the Greek behind it is kanaios it's not a Greek word at all the Greek is simply a transliteration from the Aramaic the Aramaic is almost identical to the Hebrew uh, which is uh, Q a n a n a Q a n a n a something along that order of course, you can spell differently when you go from Aramaic or Hebrew and try to transliterate to English. But you really don't have a Greek word. You've got an Aramaic word in Matthew and Mark that's transliterated in Greek. And all you have is basically, and then we have it right over more or less into English as uh, Canaanite, C-A-N-A-A-N-I-T-E. So what does the word mean in Aramaic? Well, this opens up the whole question for you it means zealous that's what the word means the word simply means zealous to be zealous all right then along our along the line of our study in the second place canaanite c-a-n-a-a-n-i-t-e canaanite canaanite could certainly would certainly not be right and that couldn't be a translation or even a transliteration. A better, if you're going to transliterate, then a better transliteration would be um, Canaanian, something like that, because we know what a Canaanite is from the Old Testament. And are we to assume that Simon is a Canaanite, a descendant of the ancient Canaanites? Hardly. If you're going to transliterate, it should look something like this in the King James. Let me see if I got enough A's and N's. Canaanian. Uh, Something like that. If you're going to transliterate. C A N A N A E A N or N A E A N. You can add on as many N's and A's as you want. I could probably take a few of those out of there and it'd be fine. That'd be more of a anglicized transliteration. Canaanite could certainly not be right. That would mean a pagan Gentile. Canaanites weren't Jews, remember. And nothing wrong with being, you know, a pagan in that sense, but a Gentile. And pagans were Gentiles. A Gentile, that'd be another matter. Could one of the Lord's 12 apostles have been a Gentile? Hardly. Because look in this same chapter here. I'm in Matthew 10, verse 5. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, Samaritan and Gentile ministry will come later. That will come in the, uh, uh, in the book of Acts under the early church's ministry, not the Lord's ministry. He said, I'm sending you only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So could you have a Gentile? Jesus said, don't go to the Gentiles. Could you have a Gentile as one of the 12 apostles? Hardly. The 12 apostles, even those that have uh, Gentile names, Greek names, are not Gentiles. They are not Greeks by any means. 
that would overthrow you know just a whole lot of the of our understanding of matthew mark luke and john the 12 apostles were all jews full-blooded jews now gentile apostles later on yes that would be fine but for now no that would not do at all so he can hardly be a canaanite uh, so canaanite is completely an unacceptable translation or transliteration and that's really what they've given us a transliteration but the transliteration is cast in the form of an Old Testament word that we already know, which would be a translation, a Canaanite, which means a merchant. Uh, that could hardly be allowed here. The better anglicized transliteration would be a Canaanian, something along that line. Then in the third place, but hold on before you change Canaanite to Canaanian. Luke, in his account, in Luke 6 and Acts 1, simply gives us the corresponding Greek term that means zealous. That means zealous. Matthew and Mark are giving us the original term as it was spoken because they spoke Aramaic. That was a local dialect. They gave us the Aramaic term even in their writing, a Greek transliteration of the Aramaic term, which also means zealous. So all that we, we really have on our hands in all four of these places is this, Simon the Zealous One, or Simon the Zealot. In Luke, we're translating a Greek word. We call him the Zealot. In Matthew and Mark, we're translating an Aramaic term when we call him the Zealot. There's no difference. We should end up with the same word since the Aramaic and Greek terms both mean the Zealous One. So let's correct that if you haven't already. Matthew 10, 4, Simon is not a Canaanite. <laughs> Simon is a zealot. It's the same Simon as Simon Zelotes. A little different form over there in Luke. Luke 6 and Acts 1. But Matthew 10, 4, Mark uh, 3, 18. Simon the zealot, not si Simon the Canaanite. Okay, and then one other thing I just want to add, this still concerns terminology, the words. If you just flip over quickly to uh, Matthew 15, if Matthew wanted to say something about Canaan or the Canaanites, he's got another word for that. The term that we find in Matthew 10, 4 is not that word. Remember on one occasion, Jesus did heal a Gentile woman, and she was a woman of what? Of Canaan. Now, she wasn't living in Canaan anymore. She lived up in Tyre and Sidon. And so she has some other connections. She's, then, she's called over in uh, Mark's gospel, I believe Mark chapter 7, a Syrophoenician or Syrophoenician. Well, that's because she's living in Syrian or Phoenician territory. But Matthew tells us her original origin in verse 22, Behold a woman of Canaan. We could, we could translate that, Behold a woman who was a Canaanite. That's a different word now in Matthew than what you find in Matthew 10, 4. So I'm saying Matthew had a term if he wanted to call si Simon a Gentile Canaanite. He's got a term for that, and he doesn't use it. Matthew's not calling Simon a Gentile or a Canaanite. He's calling him a zealous one, and he's using a local dialect, Aramaic rather than Greek. Okay, so that takes care of the passages where the word appears. Simon, Jesus' apostle, was a zealot. So what's a zealot? Well, let's come to that next. The Zealots, they were not a religious sect, so they're like the Herodians. I placed them there on the outline because I had nowhere else to place them, but rather a political party. The Zealots are Jews. They're not Gentiles. They're full-blooded Jews. They are a political party. They have goals that are, in one sense, just the opposite from the Herodians. They have goals which, in one sense, are just the opposite from the Herodians. The Herodians, because they're opposed to Jesus, are in that sense in favor of Roman rule because anything that disrupts local Herodian rule is going to bring the focus, the attention of Rome on the area, which will then rule out local Herodian rule and bring the Romans in, as I've said in the earlier message. The zealots are zealously opposed to Roman rule. 
They are radical revolutionaries whose design was the overthrow of the Roman government's control of Israel. Now, you see, the Herodians kind of would like to see something like that. They never were zealous for that because they knew, so they knew that they couldn't crush Rome. They couldn't throw Rome off. So they are content with the fact that we are being ruled by Rome through a, a half-breed who's got some Jewish blood in him, Herod Antipas. You see, they're not really wanting to throw off Roman rule, but they want to throw off Roman rule directly. That is, Roman rule directly of them. They would rather have it in an indirect fashion. The Zealots don't want Rome anywhere around them. They're not going to serve Rome, whether it's Pontius Pilate, whether it's Herod Antipas, whether it's a centurion. They're not going to pay taxes. They want to have nothing to do with Rome. They want the complete overthrow of the Roman government as far as Palestine is concerned. Now, if the, Ro if the Romans want to govern Babylon or Egypt or they want to govern Rome, let them govern. Palestine, no. It's off limits. And here's how their theory ran. Their theory ran something like this. I'm telling you their, the theology that went into their political theory. They felt that Israel, according to the Old Testament, was a holy land. Israel was a holy land. Therefore, all of its produce and resources belong to God. Now, in one sense, that's right. God was the sovereign king, they felt, over Israel. They are religiously minded people, by the way. They're not a religious sect. They're a political party. But they are a political party whose party is based on some very strong religious convictions that they have. The Herodians are whirlings, as I've said. They're not too concerned about religion. Remember, the Pharisees have to go find them. They're not in the synagogue in Mark 3. But the zealots are otherwise. They are very religiously minded, although they don't make up a sect but a political party. So since Israel is holy land, holy territory, it belongs to God. All of its produce and resources belong to God. Their conclusion was any allegiance in any form to a foreign power is tantamount to apostasy and is an affront to God who owns Israel and its resources and produce. In other words, you see, the Romans tax them on, well, we've studied different types of tax, uh, capitation taxes and different types of taxes earlier in ITP, but they would tax things like uh, the, the, uh, the catching of fish or the uh, bring into the city of grain or produce or whatever. The Romans, here's the way the zealots would think, the Romans are getting money from God's people for God's produce, what belongs to God. God is the one who owns all this, not the Romans. How can the Romans get their little hands in there and take some, you know, top share off everything? They felt that was totally wrong to do. So, you know, their only conclusion is, since we can't pay taxes, and they didn't pay taxes, and since we can't support the Roman government, and since the very presence of the Roman government here is anti-everything we stand for, it's certainly anti-theocracy, then whatever methods are necessary for the overthrow of that government, including force and violence and assassination, are all justified. And the zealots were very much into this cause. Now, before I comment on the Lord's Apostle here, let me just give you a, a little of the background of the Zealots in the first century A.D. Josephus dates their rise from evidently the year A.D. 6. That's around when Archelaus, a descendant of Herod, was deposed, banished to Gaul, and the Romans took a census. We looked at this with the Quirinius question in Luke's Gospel. The Romans took a census of the land in preparation for direct rule of Palestine by a procurator. Uh, Luke tells us this over there in uh, his early chapters. Not all that I'm telling you, but he's, he gives the background with the Quirinius uh, statements there. So you have to kind of picture some of the uh, political movements that form the backdrop to the rise of the zealots. The zealots don't even exist. They're just Jewish people who want to serve God, don't want to serve the foreigners. Rome is in control of Palestine, uh, yes, but they're in control through Herod the Great. So that doesn't cause a big problem, not yet anyway. 
uh, to what is going to become the zealots. Now, whenever they depose Herod Archelaus, now he was a descendant, Matthew 2.22, of Herod the Great. They didn't do anything up in Galilee. They left Herod Antipas up there. But whenever they deposed the um, Jewish leader down in Judea and put a, in preparation for putting a Roman leader there, that was more than this group of people, whoever, however many there were, more than they could stand. And so whenever the census is taken uh, in AD 6 in preparation for this direct uh, form of Roman rule, then the uh, people rise up and form some type of party and it in ends up being called the uh, Zealous Party or the Zealots. Now over in Acts chapter 5 and verse 37, back in those days, AD 6 I'm talking about, a Galilean rabbi by the name of Judah or Judas We've, we've covered this on some earlier tapes. Now you'll see where it fits in with the zealots. So, uh, Judah, or Judas, was, was probably one of the early founders of this group called the Zealots. He's mentioned in Acts 5.37. He was a Galilean rabbi, according to Josephus, by the name of Judah, who directed the people to resist this Roman census with force. Let me read to you Acts uh, 5.37. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days, literally, of the census. But it was a census in preparation for taxation, so you taxing is okay. But literally in the days of the census, and drew away much people after him. Much people after him. And he also perished, and all the people, as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. There's the beginnings of the zealot movement in Israel, Acts 5 and verse 37. Of course, from that verse, we see they are not successful and they are scattered, but they don't give up. The people are dispersed, but they don't give up. They're not successful at that time, but by the late 20s, A.D., 28, 29, 30, this is when Jesus comes into his ministry. By the late 20s, they are back on the scene strongly again. This is proven by the fact that Simon Zelotes is picked out of their midst by the Lord as an apostle of his. Simon Zelotes is a part of that zealot group that has arisen a couple of decades earlier. I would submit to you that it's very possible, if you'll flip with me over to Mark 15:7, Mark chapter 15 and verse 7, it's very possible that old Barabbas, do you remember Barabbas? He's gone down in infamy as the one that was released, remember, in place of Jesus. It's very possible that Barabbas was a zealot also. Notice the language of Mark 15, 7. There was one named Barabbas which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him that lay bound with them it's a group of people that lay bound with evidently he was the leader of that group he was bound with them that had made insurrection and you know what insurrection means that's a, that's a political term that's trying to throw the government off overthrow the government that's over you that's not resurrection that's insurrection treason in other words trying to overthrow the government he lay bound with them a whole group of people who had made insurrection with him as their leader, I would suggest, who had committed murder in the insurrection. I said that, the, that murder, force, violence, assassination, none of those things were beyond them in their calls to liberate Palestine from the whole of the Romans. He committed murder. Uh, he, we're told elsewhere that he was a thief. We're, you're often told that there were two thieves on the cross and that this is a thief that was also in the midst of all those other thieves that didn't end up on the cross, that was released. But he was a thief, we're told elsewhere. He was a murderer. But the big thing in Mark that Mark lets us know is that the occasion for the crimes that he committed was insurrection. That's what started all insurrection. I would suggest to you, submit to you, that he was no doubt a zealot. I don't have any proof of that, but I don't know why you'd be trying to do anything uh, to overthrow the Roman government unless you're part of a group of people, and we're told that he was a part of a group here, a part of a group of people whose goal is to overthrow the Roman government. 
They pop up, the zealots, in history again in the year A.D. 66 when they take control of Jerusalem. Now, this is very important information here. When they take control of the city of Jerusalem and begin the final war of the Jews against Rome. All that is done by these zealots. Zealots are very important people in first century New Testament, Jew especially Jewish history. You see, they are the ones, friends, uh, who occasion the fulfillment, part of it anyway, of Jesus' prophecy in Matthew 24, the overthrow of the city. They are the very people that occasion the fulfillment of that prophecy. The rest of the Jews... You see, the Jews, I don't know if you know much about the overthrow of the city and what really happened there in A.D. 66 through 73 or 4, but the Jewish nation really isn't in favor of doing anything to the Romans. They know they don't stand a chance to overthrow the Romans. But you've got a group of hotheads, of radicals, of revolutionaries, of politically-minded people who have this all based on religious ideals and aspiration of theirs, the zealots who by this time, A.D. 66, now that's 60 years after their origin and birth, who are strong enough in number, especially, as well as an influence to take over the city of Jerusalem. They take over the... Josephus tells us this. I mean, in the end, they really become more important than Pharisees, Sadducees, it seems any of them. They take over the whole city of Jerusalem. The Jews don't want to do this, but they take over the whole city of Jerusalem because they're anti-Rome. They refuse to give allegiance to Caesar and they refuse to pay their taxes. Now that taxation question with the Herodians takes on a little additional and deeper light. Uh, to say yes or no, uh, cast in this light of what we're saying with the zealots would, would, would mean a whole lot as far as the Jewish people are concerned, depending on who you are among the Jews. Uh, but the people who would say no or who'd want Jesus to say no, it's not lawful. They're very large in number and they're growing by the, this time, the late... Uh, 20s that decade okay whenever the zealots take over Jerusalem <laughs> you know the first thing that they did when they took the city over they destroyed all the records of debts kept in the city the Romans kept that there in the fortress of Antonia kept a record of debts payment of taxes and all this because the Romans had to have that for who had been paying their taxes so that's like getting into the computers of the IRS mm -hmm. As soon as they got into the computers of the Romans, the Roman IRS in Jerusalem, they just went haywire and destroyed all the records of debts. So the Romans couldn't track them down by name that way. Their revolt, of course, was an unsuccessful one. It was an extremely naive one. Politically, militarily, extremely naive to think you could overthrow Rome. Rome had just conquered the world, and you're just a little speck on the map here. The Jews, Palestine, you know, where is Palestine? Well, we know it's important to us, but Palestine compared to Egypt or, well, Greece. The Romans had just defeated the Greeks. Roman conquered the world. It's rather naive polit politically and militarily for the zealots to have these ideals, but they have them nonetheless. Their revolt, however, is unsuccessful. The fall of the city and temple come in A.D. 70. The city is besieged for many days, starvation sets in, women eat their children, all of that that happened in the original siege back in Old Testament with Babylon, all that happens over again, starvation, till the Roman army finally breaches the walls and comes in. However, do they find the zealots? No. The zealots are rather quick on foot. The zealots have escaped the city of Jerusalem. They leave... You know, they took the city over and forced the Jews to revolt against Rome, and the Jews didn't want to, and then left the Jews to be murdered by the Romans whenever they came in. Shows you what they, you know, they've got such high ideals here, they're sacrificing not only other people, you know, Romans, they're, they're assassins, but they're allowing Jews to be sacrificed for their ideals. I guess they assume that the end, what they hope for the end, their victory, the end justifies the means. No, they're not killed in the city of Jerusalem. They escape. They fled to the south east to a mountain fortress known as Masada. You've all heard of Masada. That's where the zealots went. The zealots, a large number of them, escaped from Jerusalem. They fled southeast to that mountain fortress known even of recent times from old television, Masada, where they were finally 
caught by the Romans. They commit mass suicide in the end of A.D. 73 or the beginning of A.D. 74. Well, that covers a lot of territory. The Essenes, remember, were caught back in the early years of the revolt, and they were annihilated. Their community was wiped off the face of the map. Till recent times, and they were discovered, their remains were discovered, and the manuscripts they left. The city of Jerusalem falls a couple of years later in A.D. 70. The last thing to hold out, the last Jewish stronghold, was Masada, an almost um, impregnable fortress on the top of a mountain. But it finally gave way to uh, lack of food and lack of water after being up there for four years now. And the Romans come up and find... I think only a woman and maybe a child left. They commit mass suicide. All right, let me say a few more things and we'll be through with our study of the zealots here. The uh, critical scholars who have nothing better to do than be critical yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> often try to find a connection between Jesus and the zealots. You know, like they did, like they tried to between John and the Essenes. They're always trying to find some type of earthly connection between these, you know, strange religious characters so they can uh, demystify them, I guess. And they point to the fact that Jesus had in the apostolic ban a zealot. For the continuation of this message, And they point to the fact that Jesus had in the apostolic ban a zealot. They're trying to find a connection between Jesus and this zealot movement. Another thing the critical scholars try to point to is Jesus' cleansing of the temple. That's a radical, um, revolutionary type move of his. But the critical scholars, as you could already guess in advance, are really grasping for straws here. Uh, in the first place, his cleansing of the temple has nothing to do with Rome. That's a religious statement he's making to the Jewish people. That has nothing to do with overthrowing Roman government. Jesus' response in the second place to the taxation question proves that he is no sympathizer with the zealots. Now, you have to think about that for a moment when I... When you go back earlier and remember what the zealots' uh, theory and philosophy of life and theology was all about. This is God's land. This belongs to God. The Romans don't have any right and say so and blah, blah, blah. That all sounds pretty good. Until you hear some more things I'm going to say in a moment. But that all sounds pretty good. Is Jesus a sympathizer with them? Under no circumstances. Under no circumstances. What does he say? The taxation question. Pay your taxes. Does he not? If it's got Caesar's picture on it, it must belong to him. It's not finder's keepers. It's return to the one who's lost it. Give it back to Caesar. He is implicitly teaching, obey the authorities and pay your taxes. Under no circumstances is Jesus a zealot in that sense, a political zealot. He's certainly eaten up with the zeal of the Lord of hosts. The zeal of the house of God has eaten him up. That type of zeal, a spiritual religion, not a political zeal, not at all. He's no sympathizer with the zealots. He and his apostles taught submission to governmental authority, not their overthrow. But I think that taxation question just shows how many people must have been either zealots or sympathizers with the zealots who'd be expecting, wanting to hear, and mad if they didn't, a no answer. When Jesus said, should we be paying? When they said, should we be paying our taxes? They wanted Jesus to say no. Expected that, wanted to hear that, or whatever. But on that taxation question, Jesus gives a conditional yes. Yes, pay your taxes. Yes, it's a conditional yes, though. Submit to the authorities as long as you remember that God also has obligations on your life. Render to God the things that belong to him. Now, over in Acts chapter 21 and verse 38, a term appears over there. It's a Greek word that comes from a Latin loan word uh, that you often see as sicari. S-I-C-A-R-double-I. The Sicari. S-I-C-A-R-I-I. -I. Which literally means the dagger men. The dagger men. 
And in Acts 21 and verse 38, uh, we have a reference to assassins. I think the King James translates it murderers. Assassins would maybe be a better translation. Doesn't matter, murderers is okay because they did murder. And the, the people being referred to here may well have been a part of the zealots. Josephus tells us about this episode. I'll read Acts here in a moment. Let me just uh, brief you on very quickly on Josephus. He tells us that there was once a fanatical, a nationalistic Jew uh, who had been born in Egypt. He was of Egyptian uh, background geographically, but he was a Jew, very fanatical, very nationalistic, that is, in favor of the nation of Israel. And he led several thousand men to the top of the Mount of Olives, uh, promising them that the walls of the city would fall down as a sign like God gave for Joshua in the capturing of Jericho in uh, uh, Joshua chapter 6, that the walls of the city would fall down and that these men uh, would go up into the city and slaughter the Roman garrison stationed there. Well, that didn't exactly happen that way. And the Roman leader who's at Jerusalem at this time and, you know, whose head would have been on the block if that had taken place, he knows about the story. And he questions Paul in verse 37. As Paul was to be led into the fortress, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Paul's evidently talking in Greek. Art not thou that Egyptian which before these days madest an uproar and led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers. What's that a reference to? Probably to the zealots. They're really on the rise at this time. And uh, this is much later now than the gospel account. Probably a reference to the zealots here. They are murderers. The Sicarii are dagger men. They kept daggers hidden in their clothes and they would murder people at festivals and people they didn't want and Roman soldiers and if they could sneak up on them they would commit murder, assassination, they'd murder them. And you know the Romans have taken notice that something's going on here and then you've got all this coming to a head anyway in verse 38 or the experience is told in verse 38. It's not successful at that time and old Claudius Lysias who is the chief captain of the Roman garrison can only assume that Paul, he must be that Egyptian. Because look, the Jews are having a big problem with him. See, you remember, not all the Jews supported the movement of the uh, zealots. But then what about, let's come to in conclusion here, what about the fact that Jesus did choose a zealot for an apostle? The critical scholars have made use of that fact to say Jesus must have been sympathetic or maybe even connected to a part of the movement of the zealots. Well, let me give you a little more of the background concerning the zealots and their philosophy. They based their movement on an Old Testament character, not Abraham, David, Moses, none of those, one that's not very well known, but he was very popular to them. He was their hero, we could say. The zealots felt that the Old Testament character Phineas was their prototype. Numbers 25, 7 to 13. Do you remember the story of Phineas? He was zealous for God and for the law and for Israel. Remember whenever the Moabites began to infiltrate, this is Numbers 25, the Jewish people by sending their women in all at the council of that wonderful false prophet Balaam whenever they were beginning to be infiltrated, then uh, they are having an occasion where Moses was calling the people to repent. They were all before the tabernacle, down on their faces, repenting to God for marrying these Moabites. And while they're all down there, here comes one Jewish man in broad daylight in front of them all, carrying this Gentile pagan worshiping other gods, Moabite, along with him, taking her right into his tent for an affair, I mean, and brought, everyone saw it. Phineas couldn't believe the nerve of the man. This is all told to you in Numbers 25. And he said to himself, if no one else is going to do something about it, I'm going to do something about it. He went and caught that man right evidently in the act of an affair and ran his javelin through the man and through the woman. He killed both of them. And God made a covenant with Phineas, if you read Numbers 25, and said because of his zeal, uh, his name won't perish. 
uh, his name will be remain forever. There'll always be a man of Phineas to stand before me. So the zealots based a lot on that. Well, of course, you've got two different situations, though, friends. One is trying to, you know, correct uh, spiritual laxity and um, apathy in Israel in the Old Testament. And another is trying to overthrow Roman authority. Two different things. Just because they could base their, they thought they could, their actions on their Old Testament hero Phineas didn't make the zealots right. Yes, Israel was ruled by foreigners, Rome. But here's what I wanted to get to. One of the things, anyway, tonight that's important. Remember, although Israel, yes, is ruled by foreigners, Rome, and yes, Israel belongs to God, the nation is God's, and the produce is God's, and so how can you pay taxes or stand around while you've got Gentiles ruling over you? Remember, Israel didn't just innocently fall into this situation of having Gentiles rule over her. Israel is in that situation because of her sins. The zealots could have better spent their time being zealous over spiritual matters and not political matters. I'll give you a verse, Jeremiah 29, 7. What did Jeremiah advise? What was his advice for those Jews that were taken captive by the Babylonians? And he said, try to overthrow them. You don't belong under them. God is your only master. What did he say? Submit. Build your houses. Plant your gardens. Marry, give in marriage. Submit. Why? There's nothing you can do about it. You're there because of your sins. In 70 years, God will set you free. In other words, the zealots have no biblical authority, no biblical basis at all for trying to overthrow the Roman government. It's not as though Israel fell into that by military defeat or something. Israel, as the Old Testament will prove to us over and over again, could not have been defeated. It was impossible to defeat Israel That's right. unless you caught Israel in sin. Amen. God fought her battles for you. See, you can't defeat God. Israel was invincible. God said, one of you will put a hundred to flight and ten of you a thousand to flight. Right. And they did. Remember Gideon? Three hundred men overthrew a host beyond number of Midianites and others, the children of the East. They lay along the shore as grasshoppers for multitude down in the valley. 300 men. Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 20. I don't know how many men overthrew the army there of the enemies, but they were choir members, however many they were. God said, don't worry. I'll go out and I'll fight your battles for you. How many men did it take to kill the Egyptians? None. Just God. No one lifted a spear, a sword, a Tommy Hawk, nothing. God brought them into the water and all of their foolishness and presumptuousness to think that we're going to come in. I mean, they should have stopped and thought, what a miracle. Let's worship the God of these people. Yeah. They thought not only, you know, what a miracle, we're going to capitalize on the miracle of their gods. You talk about somebody who's blind and foolish, who has a part of a flint stone, a rock. How could you behold the, the opening of the waters of the Red Sea? You know your God didn't do it to let your enemies escape? Hardly. And you go in after them? Hardly. You know their God did it. And you think their God is going to open the water and let them escape and let you in to catch them? <laughs> That's ignorance. That's stupidity of the highest order. <laughs> they should have fallen on their face and worshipped the God that opened up the Red Sea. They went in there, and how many men did it take? None. God closed the waters up, and they sank as a stone, Moses tells us in his psalm. They sank as a stone. All of Pharaoh's chariots and horses were cast into the sea. You couldn't defeat Israel. She was invincible. Can't defeat the church. Can't defeat you as an individual believer or Christian. You can't. That's impossible. God fights our battles for us. But you catch Israel in sin, though, that's another matter. Hey, you know, if you're in a problem for sin, then you just got to submit until God somehow gives you a way to get out of it. But you can't fight and overthrow it. you would be fighting against God who wants you there and submitted to learn a lesson that you couldn't learn, evidently, in years of peace and prosperity. God wanted Israel there to learn a lesson. What would have happened in the future? I don't know. Of course, we know that God knew that they wouldn't submit. That's why Jesus gave that prophecy. But it took the zealots to fulfill his prophecy. I mean, let's speak hypothetically here for a moment. What if the zealots had not been? 
and Israel had learned to lovingly, obediently submit to the yoke of Rome and at the same time get back on the right track spiritually. Well, of course, this is all a hypothesis, but the conclusion would have probably been something like this. God would have sent in another nation to overthrow the Romans and let the Jews go free. He did that before. The Babylonians were in control of them. The Medes and the Persians came in, destroyed the Babylonians, and God worked through the new leader, Cyrus, of the Medes and Persians and set the Jews free. God would have just sent in another nation. I don't know who it would have been, but some other nation to come in, overthrow the Romans, and set the Jews free. But that couldn't happen. That wasn't going to happen, and Jesus had prophesied otherwise. Something is going to happen that causes the overthrow, the final overthrow of the nation. And so his prophecy is all intertwined and wrapped up with the movement uh, of the zealots. We know from the Bible, the Bible teaches submission to those in authority, Romans 13, 1 to 6. But what about the Lord's selection of this man, Simon Zelotes? Well, he would have had to give up his earlier notions. He is no longer a zealot. Don't misunderstand when Luke calls him Simon Zelotes. He's referring to him by a past tense title, evidently one that he was well known by. I mean, don't we call ourselves a former Roman Catholic or former Presbyterian or, you know, whatever? Or you might not even use the word former. You might say, you know, such and such is a Roman Catholic. Maybe we're kind of so far removed from that we don't talk exactly in that terminology. But if you had picked up a, a really well-known name, it may stick. And it evidently did with Simon Zelotes. He was one of the, evidently the only of the apostles who was a zealot. And, of course, Luke and Matthew and Mark may mean something else by that. I think they mean that in the first place and primarily that he was formerly a member of the Zealots. But surely we could see some spiritual uh, application for that. Amen. That God took the political zeal and enthusiasm of this man in more or less a right channel. I mean, it was right in the sense that he wanted to belong to God and the nation to belong to God. He was just going about it the wrong way. And he found out how to go about it. It's just something spiritual. It's invisible. The kingdom of God comes to you in your heart. You can't overthrow the Romans. But you can have God's rule in your own heart every day. Amen. And pay your taxes anyway and still have God ruling over you. Amen. Jesus chose Simon Zelotes, a zealot. But Simon Zelotes did not remain a zealot politically. He had to give up that or he would have been contrary in his interpretations against Jesus concerning paying taxes. Jesus would not have chosen an apostle who was opposed to paying taxes when Jesus said, submit, pay, render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's. Okay, finally then in conclusion, what about some modern parallels? Not only with the zealots, but with the Herodians. Well, you find different groups of religious people today in the church I'm talking about. Let's first of all discuss the Herodians, supporters of some political party or group because of the fact we'd rather have them than someone else. And it's something of recent origin in the church in America. Oh, you have to only go back maybe a decade. That's really all a decade in time, a little more maybe, 15 years. But especially is it true in this century that you are in, you are, or in this decade rather, you are seeing an increasing rise in a political movement in the church. You saw it back with Jimmy Carter as president. You certainly saw it. I mean, Jimmy Carter was what brought it all on the scene. The evangelicals got out there and got a born-again Southern Baptist man in the White And I have to admit, in our day and age, uh, that is just almost like a miracle, a Southern Baptist. Because the Southern Baptists are the narrow people, you know, that believe the whole Bible is supposed to anyway. Southern Baptist as president, I uh, myself almost have to say divine intervention to do that. But... He wasn't a Southern Baptist who kept his convictions up. You can't be a Christian and keep convictions in an office like that. Amen. But he was Southern Baptist in title and name tag. Ronald Reagan, two terms. First two-term president in what? I don't know, several decades now. We haven't had two-term presidents. They go back way into what? The 50s, I guess. Two-term presidents. First two-term president all this time now. Ronald Reagan, what's he? Well, you know, he's a born-again believer. Talks about God all the time. Christian. Doesn't go to church because presidents can't because it causes too much of a stir when a president comes to church. But 
believes in God and country, morals, all the moral questions Reagan would come down on the right side of. Well, I'm saying that you've got a group of evangelicals out there who are kind of like the Herodians in that they don't want direct rule of these liberals like a governor from Massachusetts or someone else. They want rule by the people that are close to them, but they're very, very politically minded. So politically minded that they end up losing any religious sphere that they had to them, any religious side to them. Take Pat Robertson and his followers, for example. Whenever Pat Robertson was running for president, he had followers from the grassroots up all over this country. And whenever, and I've never been involved, so this is from, this is secondhand I've read about, I wouldn't want to be involved. But whenever you're involved in a political campaign, it's day and night, day and night, seven days a week. When you're some coordinator, you better believe it. You're a coordinator of some presidential candidate in some state or whatever the first, you know, caucus is going to be. It's on the telephone. It's traveling. It's stumping all the time. Talking about world, all in the name of trying to get someone elected to some perishable, passing away, earthly political office. Amen. When you could have spent all of those hours in prayer and intercession for the nation, if you want to talk about politics, against the devil, against all types, you could have spent so much time elsewhere, more beneficial causes. The Herodians, I see a modern parallel today. The Zealots. Well, we even find zealots sometimes in their midst. The zealots. These are the guys who are for the overthrow. Well, just look at those outside abortion clinics. Look at those who write letters to their senators and congressmen. Look at those who picket and protest at the Supreme Court building. You know, the zealots. We want to overthrow this God from Rome called secularism. We want to overthrow, we want to throw this off of our nation. It's always a political thing, a national thing. This country, this country, it's a God and country thing, like Israel, the zealots had. This country belongs to God. So I see parallels in. Remember that the zealots and the Herodians aren't leaders. They're not religious leaders like the, um, you know, Pharisees or Sadducees were. They're not a monastic sect like the Essenes were, they are just people who are into politics, either because they like politics or because they don't like it and they're trying to overthrow it. But they're in for political reasons. All you got to do is, I started to say turn on the tube, but you don't have one to turn on. So <laughs> however you find out, watch the evangelicals, God and country, God and country, God right. and country, right. for the overthrow of certain aspects and for the support of others. You've got zealots and Herodians in the same group for the overthrow of some aspects and for the support of others. Spinning their wheels, spending all their time caught up in politics, calling people, will you vote for this person? Can you imagine? I mean, you talk about something that's vain, that's worldly, that's a waste of time. Something that's so perishable as political office. Even the Supreme Court, even though it's a long time, it's perishable, so perishable. And especially as some congressman for a couple of years or a senator for four years or president even for eight years, two terms. Can you imagine spending, when you get home, after you've had a busy day at work, you've got to get on the telephone with a telephone book, with a pad of names here, and call number after number after number. Will you support? Will you support? Or call number after number after number saying, will you sign my petition? Will you sign my petition? Talk about something vain, something that's empty. That's perversion and wickedness in the church today, wasting all of their time. Kingdom of God's not in meat or drink or politics or petitions or voting or offices. Kingdom of God is in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Amen. Spirit. Amen. Wasting all of their time. Praise. I was even part of a charismatic church where because they weren't being taught the deeper word they didn't know, should have known just from their knower. You don't have to be taught. Petitions were brought to church to sign. There's this local television. Well, if you're going to go after one, you've got to go after all the old filth bags out there. But there was one local television station, or maybe it was radio, I forget. I didn't sign it, obviously. I don't remember the, the uh, details. But they had some, some filthy language. Well, you're not going to get rid of the world's filthy language. 
And what are you doing with a television set soaking all that garbage in anyway? <laughs> you know, my attitude about it, if you don't like all of that, throw your television set away. Right. If you don't like what you're getting in school, get out of it. Amen. If you don't like what you read in the newspaper, don't read it. Amen. You know, it's the zealots who want to change the world so that the world revolves around them. Hey, we're supposed to be a different, separate people who aren't even involved in all of that nonsense out there. Amen. You know, all I can think of when people are bringing me petitions saying, well, look what they said on a local television station, is, well, who cares? That's the world's medium. That's their God. Let them have it. Let them enjoy it. They're going to suffer forever in hell. Let them have a little pleasure. Give them a little pleasure. I mean, be merciful to them. They like to hear all that trash. Let them have it for a little while. Don't take that away from them. They... They might get religious on us. We don't want religious people. Now, if they want to get born again, that's another matter. We don't want any more religious. We got our, we're full up to our ears with religious people. And that's all you've got in these movements out there of either supporting a senator or trying to get him out of office. And you notice, and, and so what are we supposed to have now? A few days from now, another Christian. You can already believe it. Three big ones in a row. Wow, three big ones in a row. What is he, an Episcopalian? He, I told you before, whenever he was campaigning, he had to hire an evangelical just to teach him the terminology that Christians use. That's how ignorant he is. And he's our president, so we will pray for him. But I have to say what's true about what's true. He had to hire an evangelical to teach him Christian terminology. He didn't know words like born again. You don't use that, friends, I guess you know, in the Episcopalian church. You just go to church. You don't get born again. You don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, you might, not know, you might know God or something. Jesus Christ, maybe. That's, ugh, you just hate to have to say it. It just gives you the creeps to say it. Yeah, it does for those political leaders out there. I'm sure there's something that just lowers the boom on everyone out there when they say that name, Jesus. Jesus. Especially someone who has been to church and has heard something. But he had to hire an evangelical to teach him. Now, this is what we mean by, you know, inspiration. Or this is the debate over in Aaron. He didn't even know any of that. You couldn't. When your life for the last, what, 40 years has been all wrapped up in politics, you don't have time for religion. Politics is, you know, it's a from sunup to sundown type job. It's all the time. And you've got a whole lot of people out there who are just breathing sighs of relief that we didn't get this governor from Massachusetts who's a card-carrying member of the ACLU in there. What would that have led in our, to in our country? Nothing worse than where we're going, I know that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe led us there more quickly, yeah. <laughs> but nothing worse. It's a great delusion, friends, I would say, to ever have some, quote, born again, unquote, man. That's a great spirit of delusion in the land. That just causes people to sit back and just rejoice. We finally have a Christian in the highest office of the land. It means nothing, absolutely nothing. It's just a strong spirit of delusion that God has allowed. I've said that before. That's the only way I could explain even someone like Carter or Reagan getting in office. And by the way, Reagan wasn't exactly a Christian. I mean, anyone who follows the stars like they did, you're not Christian believers. That is sorcery. That's witchcraft. That's something you find, by the way, in Africa. You're not supposed to find that among civilized people. But New Age movement has even taught civilized people to be dumb, that the stars influence your life. You'd have to be a fool, an ignoramus, with a second-grade education to believe such nonsense. But we've got the highest man in the land believing such nonsense, as well as his wife. A born-again Christian? No. Now, was Jimmy Carter a born-again? Let's don't get into all of that tonight. I don't know. Maybe Jimmy Carter was, but Jimmy Carter didn't live his convictions. You can't. You can't live Christian convictions because one of them will tell you you don't serve in the world's forces here. You serve God. But, you know, ever since he's been out of office, he still maintained religious ties and does good works and always working for humanitarian and charity purposes. But, you know, a lot of lost people can do that as well. Whether it's convictions or genuine, I don't know. But w with the political leaders since then, we have something entirely different. I mean, a Southern Baptist is a Southern Baptist. If you are one, you're committed to something. But an Episcopalian, Presbyterian, you're committed to nothing. Just churchiness, religiosity is all. So there are a couple of the parallels I would see in modern times between uh, those two groups.